In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this talk, also those online and those who will be hearing it on Radio Maria. This is the last of the uh, seven talks, and what's its theme? Well, I said at the beginning that the Eucharist is something that's hidden in nature and in human life, in ordinary meals, for example, is anticipated in the Old Testament, especially by the Passover lamb, was instituted at the Passover, is celebrated in the church, and reach its, its fulfillment in the heavenly kingdom, the marriage supper of the Lamb. But in a way, I left something out there, and that's between those last two, worth adding, that the Eucharist is lived out in the life of Christians, hidden in nature, and human life, anticipated in the Old Testament, instituted at the Last Supper, celebrated in the church, but lived in the life of Christians. So we're dealing, you could think of it like this, we're dealing with a, a double translation because uh, at the Last Supper, Jesus translated, in inverted commas, Jesus translated the event of his death and resurrection into a sacrament. It's one reality, but in a different modality, you might say. And then in turn, this sacrament, the Mass, which we're used to, calls for translation into life. And that indeed is what it's for. The Paschal mystery, the death and the resurrection of Christ, is something we can celebrate sacramentally. But most of all, it is something in which we are called to participate existentially use a grand word. It's something to be lived. If not, uh, we run the risk, in St. Paul's words, of eating and drinking unworthily. Otherwise, it's worth nothing. Beautiful celebration, but then if we all start slitting each other's throats straight after, what does that mean? Uh, we don't want to be dead branches of the vine. So, it's this element of living out the Eucharist that I would like to talk about tonight. Now, the first Christians, the early Christians, the people we meet in the New Testament, were obviously people who felt that something great and good and powerful had broken into their lives, big time. They were people surprised by joy. And a big part of that was for them, they had a new way of life. They had a new way of seeing everything, and including God, and a new way of being, of living, even in daily life. And the interesting thing is this, that when they start to describe this, uh, the language they often use for, their, for this new Christian life, which comes from faith and baptism, the, the language they use is often liturgical language, the language of worship. So St. Peter, in his first letter, for example, like living stones, be yourselves 
built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That's the Christian life. A few verses later, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and so on, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the Christian life is a declaration of the marvelous works of God. That is liturgical language. That's what we do in the liturgy. Now then again, in the letter to the Hebrews, through Christ then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So what is the Christian life? It's offering up a sacrifice of praise to God through Christ. Now, perhaps the most powerful passage here is this. This is from St. Paul, letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's how he describes, that's the language he's using for the liturgic, for the Christian life. That to present, present is a liturgical word, uh, to present your bodies, which means your whole self in this world, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. So the Christian life is a life of worship. It, uh, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. It's liturgical language. So even having a meal is a liturgical event for the early Christians. So the Christian life in these and parallel passages is understood as a, as a grateful, praiseful offering of oneself, one's bodily life, to God the Father in union with Jesus Christ. Now, in this kind of language, it, the background of it is the Old Testament liturgy. Uh, but there's also parallels to, to, to Christian liturgy. So when, for example, uh, St. Paul says, which is your spiritual worship, uh, that phrase appears in the first Eucharistic prayer. Uh, I, I think it, I can't remember how it's translated. I think it's spiritual. It may be spiritual worship or spiritual offering. So it's not, <laughs> there's, a, there's a sort of transfusion here. Um, that some of this liturgical language that the early Christian writers use are, are go into the liturgy of the church, but then it, it, it's maybe working the other way around as well. So there's this, it's all very porous. So what it, the Christian life is both worship of the Father in spirit and in truth, as Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, and, of course, it's the service of others, the washing of each other's feet. So it, it has, Christian life has a vertical dimension and a horizontal dimension. It relates to God, it relates to others. But both of these, this is the point, both of these echo, prolong, translate, in inverted commas, what we celebrate in the Eucharist. In other words, the Christian life is Eucharistic. There's, a, the, there's complete follow-through, prolongation, unity between what is celebrated in the Mass and how we 
live. Now, the early Christians picked this up and used Eucharistic language of themselves, especially in the ultimate crisis of martyrdom. So, St. Ignatius of Antioch, he's on his way to Rome in about the year 100. And seven, he was Bishop of Antioch, and he was, as it were, arrested and uh, sentenced to death by being thrown to the beasts in Rome. So he had to make this long journey under guard, and on the way, he wrote some wonderful letters. And in one of these letters, he describes himself as God's wheat, which will, uh, through the teeth of the animals, very vivid, become Christ's pure bread. He will become bread through his martyrdom. Well, that's Eucharistic language. Now, 60 years later or so, a saint we, we remember in February, Saint Polycarp, and he was martyred as an old man, 87 years old, uh, and the whole, there's, there's, there's a surviving early Christian account of his martyrdom, very interesting. And the whole idea of it is that he is, through, through the process of martyrdom, he was actually burned to death, rather horrible, um, th that he was becoming a Eucharist. And the, a strange thing happened that as he burned, the, the Christians who were there, kind of supporting him and watching this thing, smelt bread. There was this smell of bread. The, 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 the fire, he was put on the fire, and the fire blazed up, and it, and it came around him like a great sail. And there was this smell of lovely fresh bread coming out. But okay, this is, you know, <laughs> a little bit unusual, shall we say. But the point is Eucharistic life, that he, he was becoming Eucharist at that very moment. So let's explore this, uh, this, this whole idea that the Eucharist is something to be lived. Now, uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, um, one of his um, teaching documents was called Sacramentum Caritatis. It was on the Eucharist, and he there he, he says uh, in, in in this document the Eucharist is three things. The Eucharist is a mystery to be believed. We have a lot of teaching about the Eucharist. The the Eucharist is a mystery to be celebrated. We have the liturgy, the mass. And thirdly, the Eucharist is a mystery to be lived. And he calls the Eucharist the form of the Christian life. Now, form in this sense, not meaning outward form, but the inward shaping principle, what makes something to be what it is, the inner power. And so the inner power, the, the shaping factor of the Christian life is the Eucharist. There is nothing authentically human, he says, our thoughts and feelings, our words and deeds that do not find in the sacrament of the Eucharist the form they need to be lived to the full. This applies to each of us as individuals and to us together. It applies to ordinary daily life, um, just pottering around the house or whatever, and to times of great suffering. It applies to the life of lay people, the life of families, to the life of a priest or a religious, the life of a parish. It affects how we pray and our every human relationship. It affects how we understand and accomplish our work, artistic work, for example, or social and political action, or care for the environment, or teaching, or nursing, whatever it may be. For the Christian, it all already is Eucharistic. It, it is a thanksgiving to God, 
to what the Eucharist is, and a gift of self to others, which is what Christ does in the Eucharist. Um, so our life, whether we register it or not as Christians, so far as we are Christian in our daily life, is Eucharistic, but it can become so ever more consciously and explicitly. This is a beautiful way and a true way, a real way, of bringing our lives into one. And so we arrive at what Pope Benedict calls Eucharistic consistency, so that our life is consistent with the Eucharist. It is congruent with it. So a, 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 a consistency, a congruence grows between what we celebrate at Mass in a church on a Sunday and what we do during the rest of the week. It is all done in the strength of that food. We remember the story of Elijah, who uh, the angel provides this mysterious food when he's really dejected and exhausted and down and being chased out by Jezebel. This, this mysterious food is given him. And in the strength of that food, it says, he walked 40 days and nights till he came to the mountain of God. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a symbol of our life. In the strength of the Eucharistic food, we walk through the desert 40 days and 40 nights. That's through life till we come to the mountain of God, till we meet God in heaven. So it is all worship of God through the service of others. Okay, so I hope that makes some sort of sense. I'm going to put it a bit more concretely in a moment. That's all, that's sort of a bit of the, the theology. But you, you may remember at the, at, in the first talk, I mentioned what um, some martyrs in the year 304 in North Africa said. They were prohibited, uh, the emperor put forth a decree, and they were prohibited to come together on a Sunday. I don't like this idea of these Christians gathering on a Sunday. They must be up to something. So we're going to prohibit that. And uh, the, 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 these people, these Christians, went ahead and met on Sunday anyway. And they said, without the Sunday Eucharist, we can't live. We can't live. Sine, sine Dominico, which actually means not... Sunday, but the Eucharist, but the seed on Sunday. Uh, sine Dominico non possumus, they said. We can't. They didn't even say we can't live, actually. They just said we can't. We can't function. We can't do anything without the Sunday Eucharist. Now, that's a very strong statement. And uh, Pope Benedict picks up a similar remark of St. Ignatius of Antioch. That was... 200 years earlier, and he describes Christians as, the, as those who live according to the Lord's day. He's saying that the Jews live by the Sabbath. We Christians live by the Lord's day. But what did they do on the Lord's day? You know, they didn't go to the beach and things. They, they came together to celebrate the Eucharist. So it, it's another way of saying Christians are those who live by the Eucharist, by the day of the resurrection, Sunday, first day of the week, and the day of the Eucharist. Okay, so let's put some flesh on this and think of some real people and how the Eucharist translates into our life in all sorts of situations and circumstances. Now, obviously, some of the examples we're left with are quite um, strong and extreme, as mentioned with the martyrs. But here's a modern one, also pretty extreme. But uh, you'll have heard of, of St. Edith Stein, also known as Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, her name in religious life. She was a German Jew. And in August 1942, 
uh, the Gestapo. She, she and her sister, they had moved out of Germany. They were both Carmelite nuns, and they were living in a Carmel in the Netherlands, which was under German occupation, but they thought they would be a bit safer there. But um, they, they weren't, and the, uh, the Nazis decided to round up all Christian Jews, Christian Jews, Jews who'd become Christians had hitherto been safe, but that came to an end. And so they turned up at the convent door. There was, you've got to imagine the scene, you know, many films would, <laughs> you know, lend themselves to this, but there at the, you've got a long alleyway down from the convent, down to the road, and there's the black car and the two, and the Gestapo men are there, and these two women are called out, and they're, they have to walk towards the black car, and of course that would be beginning a journey that would end in Auschwitz. Now, just think what was happening to them. Edith's sister was called Rosa, and they'd been, they'd lived in this community of nuns, first in Germany and then in the Netherlands for several years, and suddenly they're taken away, that support system, as it were. They're, they're taken away from their home. And, if you think of it, they're also being taken away from their sacramental life. They, in living in that environment, they had been receiving, going to Mass every day, receiving Holy Communion every day, and that would come to an end. Suddenly, brutally, come to an end. So she would never receive the Eucharist again. But she is now, they now are about to live the Eucharist supremely. So imagine the alleyway, the, the poplars or whatever, walking down, and Edith, who's the stronger person, is aware of her sister just plain terrified and trembling. And she turns to her sister and puts out her hand to her sister and says, uh, come, Rosa, give me your hand. We are going for our people. Come, Rosa. Give me your hand, we are going for our people, meaning the Jews, meaning we are about to offer our lives, Eucharistic, for our people. And come, give me your hand. The Eucharist is a gathering. The Eucharist is brothers and sisters together, living the Christian life together. And so when she says, give me your hand, that is also Eucharistic. That's also Eucharistic life. To give our hand to another. And then we are going for our people. Jesus says, this is the, the, the chalice of my blood, which will be poured out for you and for many. So it's, uh, it's a, I find that a very moving moment. That's the moment when she's no longer going to receive Holy Communion. Her, her sacramental life, her Eucharistic life is finished, but she's living it. She is becoming the Eucharist. That's our vocation. The Christian life is a life for God and for others. It's pro, pro pro-life. Don't we say in one of the Eucharistic prayers, we pray, may he make of us an eternal offering to you. Christ is an eternal offering, but we are, may he make of us an eternal offering to you. You can think of those words covering those two women as they went to their destiny, as it were. Okay, there's an example. Here's another one. This is in a, a different domain of witness. 
social and political activity. I don't know if you've heard of this man, very interesting, very inspiring person indeed, called Shahbaz Bhatti. He was a Catholic Christian Punjabi, uh, a Pakistani, who was born in 1968, so quite a bit younger than some of us, and was assassinated by terrorists linked to the Taliban on the 2nd of March 2011, not long ago. Now, from his, he was brought up in a very Christian environment in Pakistan, and from his teenage years, uh, he was, he was dedicated really to the pursuit of social justice in his country, especially in regard to the minorities. Well, of course, the Christians were a minority. Uh, the Hindus were a minority as well, and were not always treated well. Uh, interestingly, uh, he, he also chose, uh, as a young man, he chose a celibate life. Uh, even though he wasn't going to become a priest or anything like that, he chose a celibate life so as to be able to devote himself more fully to these issues. And he rose to prominence, and uh, remarkably, for a Christian in Pakistan, uh, he wa a ministerial post in the government was created for him, 2008. And he became Federal Minister of Minority Affairs and a member of the cabinet, the one Christian in the government. And uh, when he was sort of interviewed or whatever at the time of this appointment, he, he, he said he had dedicated his life to the struggle for human equality, social justice, religious freedom, and to uplift and empower the religious minorities, communities. And he accepted the post for the sake of the oppressed, the downtrodden, and the marginalized. And he said, Jesus is the nucleus of my life, and I want to be his true follower through my actions by sharing the love of God with the poor, oppressed, victimized, needy, and suffering people of Pakistan. That was what drove his life. He was explicitly moved by the example of Jesus in the gift of his life for others. And of course, that gift is made present to us and it was to him uh, in the celebration of the Eucharist. And so his biographers say of the Eucharist, when he made his first communion as a boy, it was a gift of which Shabaz would always have a profound awareness. From the time of his first Holy Communion, the Eucharist became the center of his life, the pivotal point to hold on to firmly in the most difficult moments. He lived by the Lord's day very much. He didn't go to Mass every day, but he went every, every Sunday, and that was central for him. And he knew very well that he was on a hit list, uh, and in a last interview, which you can actually see on YouTube, the last interview, when he knew very well that he was, there, were, there were people out to get him, uh, he, he, he speaks, it's, it's, very, it's a very moving thing, but he, he speaks explicitly of following Christ to the end. And what moved him very much was the, the famous saying of our Lord in the Gospel, of John about the grain of wheat falling into the ground and dying. Well, grain of wheat, grain of wheat. That's a Eucharistic saying, anyway. So it has Eucharistic implications, potential. So he seems to be a modern saint, and I think there is a move to, to um, beatify him. And a martyr of political action on behalf of the oppressed and an example of how the Eucharist can translate into someone's life, into a lay life dedicated to the marginalized and the poor. And he was assassinated, he was gunned, gunned down. 
Now, you could put other characters with him. Uh, Dorothy Day, who some of you may have heard of, American woman, 1897 to 1980. Uh, and Oscar Saint, now Saint Oscar Romero, 1917 to 1980 from El Salvador. Dorothy Day founded the Catholic Worker Movement, uh, dedicated to the marginalized, and for her, again, it's a theme, the Eucharist was at the heart of how she prayed and lived. She scarcely ever missed daily Mass, and Mass was offered. She set up these houses of hospitality where the homeless and the hungry would come, and she, um, the, the Mass was at the center of that. The Eucharist informed her attitude to those she served from literally taking, breaking, and sharing bread, sitting down with people who turned up at the door, to her more radical pacifism and in the face of atomic and nuclear weaponry and modern war. For her, you know, that, um, weapons of mass destruction were a kind of anti-Eucharist, really. They do the very opposite of what the Eucharist does. They scatter and kill, the Eucharist gathers and gives life. And um, as Archbishop of San Salvador, Oscar Romero helped sustain a whole people under oppression in the late 1970s, and he did so largely through the sermons he gave at Mass in his cathedral. And indeed, he was gunned down at the altar on, on um, the day before the Feast of the Annunciation. He had just finished preaching and was just turning to the altar to move into the liturgy of the Eucharist when he was shot. So, here, here is a realm, social and the, 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 the fighting, contesting of social and political injustice, which the Eucharist can empower. And if, if, again, we just think of what the Mass is, it has so many aspects, it offers an alternative. You're in a society that is corrupt and that, that, that where things are wrong or you are in a situation where you're being maltreated. The Eucharist just shows something quite different. It reminds us of the ultimate injustice inflicted on Jesus, that he is a victim, but more importantly, that he's the victor, that his death was a victory, that the Father vindicated him through his resurrection. And so in situations where people feel deprived of agency and victimized, they can draw from the Eucharist a, a renewed sense of agency, as we say, that they don't have to be purely passive defendants. Jesus we talked about this when we, at the institution of the Last Supper. The Last Supper, Jesus was going to be a victim the following day. The, the night before, he showed that he was a priest. He was making an offering of himself. That was the important thing. It wasn't the rogues and the villains who were taking his life. That was kind of secondary. The Eucharist again reminds us of human brotherhood because we're all completely equal in the Eucharist. We all uh, sit down at the same table. And so racial segregation, for example, in the light of the Eucharist, and many in South Africa felt that at the time, is, a, is an abomination. It's anti-Eucharistic. Um, that uh, the Eucharist is not out of place for Christian minorities trying to survive in hostile environments under Islam, for example, or for those under bombardment. Uh, so the Eucharist can mobilize the right kind of resistance. The subversive power of the cross shines out. And even in our, you know, we live in a fairly safe world, you know, more or less, uh, or safe part of the world, but still, the Eucharist can revive our sense of Christian identity and mission. Here is something different from the way the world works. The Eucharist, because it 
intimates a very different future can relativize all human systems and structures and cultures with all their power to imprison and reduce. So the Eucharist is a sacrament of freedom. It is a vision of what lies beyond the world and so makes us free within the world. That's where we get the courage to be different. It gives us hope that the way things are is not the way things have to be or necessarily always will be. It takes us beyond the fear of death, really, the Eucharist. Okay. Now, so um, what, one could, what one can look at different areas of life from the most ordinary and mundane to the more dramatic, which I suppose I've been evoking here, and see that the Eucharist has this power to enter into these and transform them from within, give them their full dimension, as Pope Benedict said. Is there any realm of life, indeed, that the Eucharist cannot transform from within? Uh, okay, why not family life? So to quote Pope Benedict, the love between man and woman openness to life and the raising of children are privileged spheres in which the Eucharist can reveal its power to transform life and give it its full meaning. So the full meaning of the love of man and women, woman and the raising of children and just the daily dramas of domestic life, the Eucharist can, as he says, transform that and give it its full meaning. Or you can take the other vocation, the complementary vocation of consecrated virginity or just the chastity of the single. And where can a person who, who is, is living that life where can they find strength and inspiration, nourishment? Well, surely in the Eucharist, it is the body of the chaste Christ which we receive in communion, which mingles, as the fathers of the church like to say, with our body and so help us in the struggle for chastity. So the Eucharist empowers the lay life of the Christian laity, the religious life of the consecrated, the pastoral life of the ordained. And just as ordinary food and drink enable our every activity, everything we do from when we get up, uh, so the body and blood of Christ form and fuel all that, that we as Christians are and do, our whole human life in Christ. Now, go off at another, into another area, completely different, perhaps, but one might think of the, the impact of the Eucharist on Christian artists and crafts people, if I'm allowed to say craftsmen, I, maybe not nowadays, crafts people. Uh, but, <clears throat> okay, now, the, the, uh, a natural person to mention here is, of course, J.R.R. Tolkien. Now, he was a daily communicant. Don't forget that. He went to Mass every day uh, of, of his life. And you may, those of you who know the Lord of the Rings will remember the, the, the bread, the elvish lembas, whey bread, viaticum, and that was a, a special bread that was more than human bread and sustained uh, Frodo and Sam on their journey to divest themselves of the ring of power. And uh, th there's th this is a very clear Eucharistic reference. 
and like it was, it was the elves who, it was the bread of angels, you know, the elves are like the angels, it's the bread of angels. And uh, it was offensive to evil creatures, so Gollum uh, refuses to eat it straight out. And the orcs, when, when Frodo is captured and he's still got a bit of this lembath with him, uh, the, 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 the orcs even hate the look of it. They hate the look of it, so they won't touch the stuff. But, okay, there's a very clear sort of Eucharistic connection, but the Eucharistic influence on writers like um, Tolkien, like Francis Thompson, the poet, uh, Jared Manley Hopkins, George Mackay Brown, many others, goes beyond sort of details or explicit illusion. What the Eucharist creates shapes is a particular outlook. This is another of it, its formative roles in life. It, it can convey a specifically create, I would say rather, a specifically sacramental imagination because it is a sacrament. And so if it is really the center of our life, then we will begin to see everything in a sacramental way, through the lens, as it were, of the Eucharist. So everything outward we experience can contain an inward grace, or simply Christ himself. According to St. Irenaeus, the Eucharist confirms the insight that the material and bodily in the universe, in ourselves and in the universe, are open to resurrection. Okay. If this bread can be transformed into the body of Christ, then we can be transformed into Christ and matter, the world can be transformed into Christ. We can receive the resurrection the Eucharist, I think, has the capacity to e engender, engender in those who let it into their lives, a way of seeing, reading, deciphering, encountering reality. So, and often the, the poets and the artists and, are, are, you know, they're, they're very sensitive to this. And so, Jared Manley Hopkins, a Jesuit poet, writes a beautiful poem about a kestrel, a wind hover, and he sees in that bird the beauty of the bird and the plumage and the way it flies and its wings and everything. He sees Christ in that, he sees the beauty of Christ in that bird. And then in another poem uh, has, has the lovely lines, Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs, and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. So we can see Christ in each other. Very beautiful. Christ uh, playing in, in other people, playing, that's like wisdom in the Old Testament, plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs, in bodies, lovely in eyes, not his, but ours, to the Father, through the features of men's faces. Now that's the Eucharistic vision of the world, okay? That's what the Eucharist can engender, is that kind of outlook. It informed the Eucharist also the poetic scientific vision of uh, the French Jesuit, Père Théard de Chardin, especially in his um, this little book, it's a meditation really, not a book, um, prayer called Mass on the World. He was, in a, he was in a desert somewhere in Asia and he had no bread and he had no wine. So he just went out in the morning and as it were in, in his heart, in his priestly heart, um, offered the world to God and, and wanted to receive the Christ who was present even in the material world. 
This prayer is a magnificent paraphrase of the Eucharistic ministry, a mystery expanded to the dimensions of the universe. For him, uh, de Chardin, the unique presence of Christ in the Eucharistic elements of bread and wine was a pointer to the further extension of Christ's presence for the growth of the mystical body and the consecration of all material reality. So, again being concrete, but if you're, you know, in, if you're an eco-warrior, um, then th that can be inspired by the Eucharist, you know, and, and maybe made saner by the Eucharist, okay. But Pope Francis says in Laudato Si that the cosmic dimension of the Eucharist makes it a source of light and motivation for all concerned for creation, our planet, our common home. Um, and it, we shouldn't forget, too, how this Eucharistic awareness has shaped, for example, the architecture and music of Western culture. Okay. Uh, think of... I mean, is not some of the most beautiful music in, of the Western world settings of the Mass? Okay. From Gregorian through polyphony, through, through the Baroque, through the classics, and even into our own day. We wouldn't have that unless we'd had the Eucharist. Uh, and then think of architecture, okay, the same cathedrals. The, the, the Sanctus... And the Benedictus of, for example, Beethoven's Missa Solemnis, Mass in D, is really worship of the Eucharist translated into music. It's almost a transubstantiation in music. He, he uses uh, a violin very wonderfully um, to evoke the presence of Christ. Or architecture, the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, very hard to beat. That's, that's the Eucharist rendered in stone, really. Astonishing building. Astonishing. So, th these are just, I'm just throwing out, this is, well, this is a soup, okay, so I'm putting lots of things in the soup to get across the simple idea that, indeed, the Eucharist is the form of the Christian life. Our life, our vocation, is Eucharistic. Whether we're single, whether we're married, whether we've got vows, whether we're ordained, whatever we are, our, our vocation as Christians is Eucharistic. It, it is actually to become what we receive, as the Father says. Now, I was privileged to know um, a Catholic lady who spent the last years of her life in, in the parish where the, the monastery um, where I hail from, Pluscarden Abbey is, and she was in the parish of Elgin. And uh, she was a highly cultured, very well-educated and intelligent person, and she'd lived a long and varied, often um, acutely difficult life. I, and um, after her husband died, she was able to devote most of her time as a Eucharistic minister for the sick within the parish. And the parish priest used to say she's worth five curates. Uh, she, uh, the work she did, visiting all sorts of people and taking them Holy Communion or preparing them for Holy Communion or whatever. And I remember when she used to come to Mass at the monastery, she'd always sit at the right at the back and often she would simply be in tears. She had a great sense of her own unworthiness. And her health was fragile. She was an old lady. She had osteoporosis and all these horrible things. But she persevered in this ministry. She had her little car, and on she went. Brittle legs, but she would take the Lord to the sick in the hospital and home. And really, you could say she lived what she carried. She was carrying the Eucharist, but she lived the Eucharist. And in a way, she exhausted herself in, in this and 
and um, finally died. He was one of the most authentically holy people I've met in my life. Last but not least, the Eucharist helps to live our death, or rather to live our dying, because it turns our dying from just a fading of the light into a Passover to eternal life. Viaticum, we call the last communion. We make a great fuss of first communion. We should make a great fuss of last communion. Uh, and it's called the viaticum, which, meaning it's something that goes with you on your journey. And the last journey that we will have to make is the journey beyond this life. And there, in eternal life, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, where sacraments will cease, the Eucharist, the, the, the reality, the inner reality of the Eucharist, the res, as St. Thomas would say, will finally flower in resurrected flesh, that's in John chapter 6, if you eat me, you will rise from the dead. There it is. In the fullness of love, it's the sacrament of charity, and the perfect unity of communion. We will all be at peace with each other. So, we are called to be, as I say, translations of the Eucharist. That's what we're called to be each of us a unique rendition of the Eucharist in our particular life. It is a very helpful, I think, and powerful way of, um, of conceiving our Christian life. Okay, one last paragraph and then we're free. Um, the because some of you may have said, well, you, you've, you, you never quite completed the commentary on the Mass. Okay, let me just put that, pick that up. Because I didn't mention the concluding rites last time we got to the prayer after communion. But I didn't mention the very end. Well, maybe this is the moment to enter it because it would make a good ending to these talks because we end with a blessing, don't we? That's how the Mass ends. Now, when did Jesus, when did, and this would be a good biblical question, when did our Lord give a blessing to his disciples? It's not something we read about much. There you are, Peter, I'll give you a blessing. Yeah. The ascension. The ascension. So, that's, as far as I can see, that's the only time. Hey, when he's going... At the close of the Gospel of Luke, at the moment of his essential, ascension, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. Now, lifting up his hands and blessing them, that was the gesture of the Jewish high priest. Jesus is revealing himself as the true priest at this moment. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. So... Maybe that blessing at the end of Mass is a reminder to us of our Lord's ascension. Because in the introductory rites of the Mass, at the very beginning, we, we can sense, as it were, a coming of Christ among us, just as he came uh, through Mary and born in Bethlehem and so forth. In the liturgy of the Word, well... There's an evocation, there's a connection, surely, to his public life, to Christ preaching. And then in the liturgy of the Eucharist, we're taken up by reenacting the Last Supper into his death and resurrection. So during the Mass, we move through the life of Christ. And in the final blessing of the concluding rites, are we perhaps being reminded, therefore, by this blessing of the ascension? And so, in the Mass, our lives and Christ's life get woven together, as it were. We, we come here with our life 
And Christ comes here when we celebrate the liturgy with his life. And so the two are sewn together and we are Christified. And what follows? After the ascension comes Pentecost and the mission begins. So the last words of the Mass, ite missa, missa, to do with mission. Ite missa est, go. Go forth, go and proclaim the gospel of the Lord. So I would love to think that maybe these talks help us to go and live what we celebrate and what we receive in the Eucharist. Go and be his body in the world. That's our vocation. Go and be the Eucharist. So may the Lord bless us all, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's it. I think Gustav does.